It's another nice sunny day in California, as usual, so I thought I'd take a stroll by the beach, as I often do, which got me thinking about anthropology again, as usual. Looking out over the distance at the deep blue Pacific Ocean conjures up thoughts of those ancient mariners of various ethnicities that courageously set off to a distant destination in search of trade or to establish permanent settlements in what anthropologists call the New World. Of course, we now know that the New World isn't all that new, and recent evidence has pushed back the peopling of the Americas over 33,000 years, which is around the same time that Europe was populated by Cro-Magnon, the first fully modern human that wasn't just anatomically correct, but modern in terms of skull morphology, such as having a chin, and advanced behavior, such as bifacial tool technology, exquisite art, and the like. While some anthropologists are stubborn and still cling to that old, obsolete, Clovis first theory involving the Bering Strait, meaning people walked over from Beringia or Alaska, it's clear that transpacific and transatlantic travel occurred during the Pleistocene or Ice Age, whether it be Solutrean people from Europe or people of an Asian phenotype over the Pacific. While I've not personally seen any evidence of sub-Saharan Africans making the voyage, I do acknowledge a global distribution of the black phenotype, which I hesitate to call African because there's nothing that indicates to me that they left from an African origin, whether it be the native black Sentinelese of the Andaman Islands in the Indian Ocean, who still live in the Stone Age, and do not have any seaworthy vessels or the tribes of Papua New Guinea, native Australian Aborigines, or genetic evidence for a black Asian phenotype during the Pleistocene in South America. Like I said, I see no evidence of these populations having anything to do with Africa except for this Darwinian obsession to link people to African monkeys and apes. They even go so far as to claim that monkeys of Asia and the New World must have come from Africa, and when I asked my professors how they got there, they replied that prehistoric monkeys sailed over a thousand miles across the Atlantic on floating islands of vegetation that broke off from the coastlines, possibly during a tropical storm. And when I asked what they ate or drank to survive, they said that there may have been banana trees or coconuts growing on these magically floating imaginary islands of wood and debris, all while acknowledging that early humans could not have possibly made the voyage. Rather insulting if you think about it. That said, I believe that the ancient myths from around the world of antediluvian seafaring populations traveling all around the globe make sense especially in light of the recent debunking of the out-of-Africa replacement theory, which did not hold up once the human genome was sequenced and compared to the DNA of other archaic hominin populations. It turns out that we're all hybrids, consisting of genetic contributions from various archaic species that lived all around the world for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. Those familiar with my work know that I attribute the specimen known as Cro-Magnon to the fabled Atlanteans of the Greek and Egyptian mythology, but they were by no means the only people that existed in antiquity. And today, I'd like to turn our attention to some interesting studies that have been published this week, which finally hint at the identity of the mysterious Denisovans whose genome has been sequenced from DNA retrieved from a pinky bone, but as of yet, there's not been a complete skeleton in the fossil record to match it up to. We know that Europeans contain about 2% Neanderthal DNA, with Asians having slightly more, and Sub-Saharan Africans receiving up to 19% genetic contribution from an archaic ghost population, which is likely Homo habilis or Homo erectus, not found in the DNA of Caucasians or Asians. And as it turns out, Melanesians, 
or people from the southwestern Pacific Ocean, have 46% DNA from Denisovans. Not only that, in a genome-wide study of over 6,000 Latin American individuals, an international team of scientists identified 32 gene regions that influenced facial features such as nose, lip, jaw, and brow ridge, nine of which were entirely new discoveries. One of these genes appears to have been inherited from Denisovans. Scientists claim that a gene that contributes to lip thickness was linked to the genetic data found in Denisovans. So while we don't have a conclusive example of Denisovans skeletal remains, we may have an idea of what their lips and some other facial features look like. The genetic distribution seems to cover not only Latin America, but Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, and East Timor. While we do not yet have conclusive evidence in the fossil record, speculation is starting to arise as to the identity of the mysterious Denisovan with one candidate coming out of the island of Flores called Homo floresensis, nicknamed the Hobbit. Without DNA sequencing though, it's just a guess, so we'll have to wait and see. Probably the most popular living proponent of the out of Africa replacement theory, which I do not subscribe to, is Professor Chris Stringer, a British physical anthropologist noted for his work on human evolution. And it's always a good idea to get a diverse perspective on these findings. So let's listen to a brief excerpt of what he has to say about Denisovans. Well, of course, the Denisova cave was under excavation for many years by Russian archaeologists, and they had found fragmentary human fossils. But it wasn't until 2010, with ancient DNA work, that it became clear that these represented a distinct kind of human that we now know as Denisovans, perhaps an early offshoot of the Neanderthal lion. And the DNA evidence suggests that this population of Denisovans existed in Denisova cave probably for at least 100 or 150,000 years. So a long occupation of the site in Denisova cave by these Denisovans and uh, even evidence that Neanderthals were at the site as well some of the time. So two, potentially two human populations occupying Denisova cave over tens of thousands of years. But the physical evidence of the Denisovans is very limited. And in the top of this diagram, we can see the evidence we've got for the Denisovans, um, uh, a finger bone, uh, some tooth fragments. There is now some fragmentary cranial material from Denisova cave that is Denisovan. And we actually have Neanderthal fossils. Uh, and in fact, although they're fragmentary too, there are actually more Neanderthal fossils from Denisova cave than there are Denisovans. And there's even what seems to be a first generation hybrid between a Neanderthal and a Denisovan parent. This fragmentary fossil, Denisova 11, uh, nicknamed Denny. So a complex site with an occupation by at least two forms of humans, and later on at the top of the stratigraphy, occupation by Homo sapiens. But what we do know about the Denisovans also is that their DNA lives on in many modern humans in Eastern Asia and Southeast Asia. And this is best explained by interbreeding with a Denisovan-like population or maybe more than one Denisovan population in Asia and Southeast Asia. So the suggestion would be that as modern humans emerged from Africa after 60,000 years ago, they first of all encountered Neanderthals in Western Asia and there was some interbreeding and that DNA was taken with those modern humans as they spread out further east. And then somewhere down in Southeast Asia, uh, there was interbreeding with Denisovans down there. And that was taken towards Australia and New Guinea, uh, where we find quite high levels of Denisovan DNA today in those populations. So populations in Asia and Southeast Asia have evidence of at least two interbreeding events. The first one, a Neanderthal one, and the second one, a Denisovan one. Both of those calculated by geneticists to have occurred after 60,000 years ago. So we can build up a network, a, quite a complex network now of Denisovan relationships. So this map shows you the Denisova cave itself, and we can make a link with 
the fossil material, as we mentioned, from Jiahe in China, uh, through dental morphology and proteomics, and also the mitochondrial DNA in the Baixia cave itself, potentially links with fossils like Pengu uh, in terms of the resemblance to the Jiahe mandible. Um, and then when we turn to the data for modern humans, we've got evidence in Tibet, for example, that there's a gene there which is Denisovan-like and which helps some Tibetan populations adapt to life at high altitudes. Um, and then down in Southeast Asia, we have these slightly higher levels of Denisovan DNA at the level of maybe three or 4%, uh, which seems to have come from interbreeding in that region of Southeast Asia and high levels of Denisovan DNA found in regions like Papua New Guinea and Australia. So in terms of judging where those southern Denisovans might have lived, the ones who put their DNA into the ancestors of uh, people like New Guineans and Australian Aborigines, um, we know, of course, that uh, Erectus was uh, a long-lived lineage uh, on Java. Homo floresiensis is on Flores. Homo luzinensis is, is there in the Philippines. So my guess, and it can only be a guess until we have better data, is that these southern Denisovans perhaps lived in this region from Sumatra, Borneo, maybe Sulawesi. This is where I would guess that those southern Denisovans may have been living. So who were the Denisovans? Well, they were a separate Asian lineage, probably a different species. If the Neanderthals are a different species with that amount of time of evolution, probably the Denisovans would turn out to be a distinct species as well, once we know more about them. So he's saying the Denisovans were a distinct species, as were Neanderthals, which Europeans have 2% genetic contribution from, and Homo habilis or erectus, also a distinct species, which Sub-Saharan Africans share up to 19% DNA with, not found in the DNA of Asians or Caucasians. The recent breakthroughs in genetics has forced anthropologists and biologists to redefine what a species is, as even the sequence genomes of various primates has shown that monkeys with different numbers of chromosomes can and do produce viable hybrid offspring as is the case with numerous other examples in nature where hybrids can be produced. And while there can be complications between various hominin cross-species interbreeding, such as the case when the body of an Rh negative mother tries to reject her own offspring if it's Rh positive, viable offspring are born and survive with gene flow contributed from both parents. In the case of Denisovans, this gene flow is shown to be not only present in Southeast Asians, but in Native American populations, which solidifies the ancestral link between these two demographics. By the way, if you're wondering where Denisovans got its name, it's of course the name of the cave where the first fossil fragments were found in Siberia, and a Russian hermit used to live in the cave in the 18th century and his name was Denis. So that's where the name comes from. So their territorial range was quite vast and theoretically could have inhabited Beringia and they could have walked down into North America or they could have been seafaring and made the voyage across the Pacific which had a significantly lower sea level during the Pleistocene. So many more islands would have been exposed making the Trans-Pacific journey easier and more plausible. Of course, one can also speculate that relatively large land masses that are now submerged may have been originally a homeland for these Denisovans, as I've speculated was the case in the Atlantic Ocean when sea levels were 400 feet lower and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, particularly around the Azores Islands, would have matched the description for the location of Atlantis in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. This would explain how Western Europe was populated by Cro-Magnon around the same time that the Americas were first being settled, making a possible origin in the Atlantic rather than in Africa. A similar scenario in the Pacific, or even in the Indian Ocean, could provide alternative points of origin for Asian phenotypes, which not only would coincide with the myths and legends we have around the world of submerged homelands, but provides a more logical and reasonable explanation for how modern races came to be.
rather than a sub-Saharan population leaving Africa 60,000 years ago, mutating into Asians around 50,000 years ago, then mutating again into blonde Europeans around 35,000 years ago. As DNA evidence indicates, Cro-Magnon was nearly identical to modern European populations. I'm not sure people like Professor Stringer will ever completely let go of the out-of-Africa hypothesis because they built lifelong careers on it, but I'm pretty sure that the next generation of anthropologists will be forced to confront the reality that we do not all share the same African ancestry, genetics, or history, and insisting that we do is probably more to do with a political agenda than a scientific one. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments. So please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon.